I'm Pastor Dallas. Love being with you. By the way, we're three days away from that holiday called Christmas. Yeah, is that what it is? So if you want to yell out a ho, ho, ho instead of an amen, I'm good with that. I'm down with that. However, however you flow this time of year, it's a wonderful time of the year. Uh, I love all the pageantry. I love all the parties. Uh, I'm guessing some of you, maybe many of you, have done at least one Christmas party this week at work or here at church or with your family. What's a show of hands? Give me at least one Christmas party you've been to. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So lots of pigs in the blanket, lots of chocolate chip cookies, some punch, some ginger ale. If I hit all the basics, yeah, and some fudge or, or whatever. So we, uh, on Wednesday, had our Bridgewood Youth Ugly Sweater Party right in here where you're at, okay? We completely transformed the auditorium into a party zone, and there's the picture behind. It kind of gives you an idea. This room is awesome. I am so blessed. Our youth program is so blessed to have the auditorium. And then we took the biggest selfie known to mankind. There's so many people in there, they're just blurred dots, but there was like 100 people here on Wednesday. We had about 81 students. We count when you have that many, you count them out to the specific amount. Yeah. And then we had uh, almost 20 leaders. So God is moving here with our students at Bridgewood. And it's not just our youth students. And I love these kids. They're right here. I bow to them. And then we have them over in 57 Club. And that club has just been growing. And then Bridgewood Kids is doing a breakfast today. Hello. Like, don't, don't exit on me yet, okay? Stay with me. Um, but they are doing just a wonderful job in there uh, with leading that. So we are doing Travel Light, and I just want, kind of want to go over our theme verse with you. This is, we kicked this, this series off December the 1st, and this was the verse we kicked it off with, and this will kind of guide us. Uh, Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30 in the message version, it goes like this. Are you tired? Worn out. This is Jesus talking. Burned out on religion. And then he says, I love this, come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Now, some of you, when you hear the words real rest, I know what's going through your mind. You're thinking right after lunch today, when I kick back in my recliner and my feet go up, that's a real rest, right? Some of you do that. I'm not doing that because my Cowboys play in a very meaningful game at 425, so I'm already jacked up for that. We want to get in the playoffs with our mediocre record, but I'll take it. So I'm not resting, but that's really not what he's talking about here. We're going to get to what he's talking about. He's talking more of a soul rest, more of a spiritual rest, not just a sleep rest. He goes, walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. I love how Jesus always sets the example. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Now, the message version is very descriptive in that, and I think meaningful, and that's why we've used kind of that version. But I want to read it in the NIV, which you may recognize, well-known portion of Scripture in the NIV, and it goes like this. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Uh huh. Weary and burdened. Now we're starting to get down to the nitty gritty. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you were here December 1st when we kicked off this series, Pastor Kurt eloquently explained what a yoke is in farming terms. It's not the inside of an egg, okay, students? The yoke is that. That, that mechanism they put on oxen and horses or any other farming animals to keep them stride and stride back in Jesus' day. Farmers still have it now, probably here in Michigan. And it was done in a meaningful, purposeful way where you have a stronger animal with a weaker animal. This is by no coincidence. 
We want to see the parallel here that Jesus is talking about because he is the stronger force when you are in relationship with him, when you bring his yoke upon you. All of a sudden, your weariness, your anxiety we're going to talk about today, the, the worry that is all built up within you becomes lessened, becomes dissipated. We're going to go into a formula for how that can happen. Basically, this series is God's solution to you being weighed down. Travel light. Let go of the baggage so you can travel light. We kicked it off uh, first week, December 1st, on my big, fat, overloaded life. Huh? Can anyone relate? You got so much stuff going on in your life. Ecclesiastes 4, 6 goes like this. Better is one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Look, that completely goes against our culture, which says if one is good, two must be better, right? So if, if one 60-inch smart TV is great, I must go after two. Maybe you can't afford that in your budget, but I need more. If one trip to Disney World is good, I want to go on another trip to Disney World before I pay off the one. You see where I'm going? Everything is stuffed. And I've actually had this, unfortunately, I'm just going to bear it to you, in the airport where my luggage was a little overweight. So I was that dude right there at the desk who was opening up his suitcase because I didn't want to pay the $50 fee and emptying out socks into a bag. It just It's uncomfortable when you're in that predicament. And sometimes we are in that predicament in our life. December 8th was a gift of margin. A couple weeks ago, we talked about how we needed to slow the pace to make space. You know, think of a notebook sheet of paper, right? The teacher says, don't write outside the margins. Leave that blank so it looks clean. It looks neat. Well, that's what we need to do in our life. And we learned that our struggles with margin are in time, money, and relationships. And so margin is a choice. It doesn't happen just poof out of the air. We have to choose that. And that's learning healthy rhythm, rhythms to manage the space for a healthy and balanced life. When I have margin, I feel better in so many areas. It's not just a physical well, well-being of a feeling. It's, it goes into spiritual. It goes into emotional. It goes into all the different capacities and components that were made up. And then December the 15th, last week, I like this. You expect the best, but you plan for the worst. We talked about how we have to be twofold in this concept. It says, Proverbs 21, 31, to do your best, prepare for the worst, then God, trust God to bring the victory. You know, expecting the best, that's your faith side. That's having a future view. God, I believe you're going to supply all my needs. That's great. I want you to have that. He is Jehovah Jireh, my provider. But then the planning for the worst is this. That's past experiences. Based on my past experiences, I need to make sure if I'm asking God to supply all my needs that I'm actually getting out, looking for a job, working that job, doing my best on that job. Does that make sense? So then I work as if it depends on me, but I pray as if it depends on God. And what a healthy combination that is. So that leads us to today. And this one can be a dicey subject. It's a subject that I think of all the roadblocks in travel light, this one can be the most menacing. It's about having a worry-free life. A worry-free life. A life that's not filled with anxiety. If we're being truthful, we all deal with this. This is part of the human condition. There's a little worry wartness in all of us. Some of us in greater capacities than others, and it it ranges in what we worry about. But today we're going to talk about trading chaos for calm, trading panic for peace, and I believe that this is a promise you can have for your life and your family's life. Look, I'm a dad. I'm a husband. God's called me to set the tone, fellas, in my home and to do it the way Jesus loves the church. So this, I hope, speaks to marriages. I hope it speaks to husbands, wives, parents with kids, because I believe stress, if you're, if you're a normal earthling like me, stress and worry and anxiety a lot of times can cultivate in the home with the people you love the most. And sometimes it comes out of nowhere. And then it can happen on your job. And then it can happen in other situations where you're just worried about the future or worried about how other people are perceiving you. In 1988, before we put it on the screen, If you were older than 35 years old, you might just remember this awesome song. So here's what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to hum it, and if you recognize it, I want you to sing along. You ready? Do, 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 do. Pastor Kurt's got it. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. It would take a Gen Zer to know that because everything's repeating. Do, 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 do. Don't worry, right? That's as good as I get in Jamaican. Be happy. Don't worry, be happy. Do, all right, everyone get up. No, just kidding. Okay, that was the youth pastor coming out of me. I've been rebuked by the Lord. Okay, don't do that in a Sunday service. You can get away in the Wednesday service. So, Don't Worry, Be Happy was the first a cappella song to ever go number one on the Billboard Top 100 chart in 1988. That's big time. And that song swept the nation. I remember I was 12 years old. Middle schoolers were singing it. Elementary schoolers were singing it. High schoolers were singing it. Your parents were singing it, embarrassing you, but God bless them. They were trying. And here's the deal. The reason that song was so huge is because we all wanted a piece of that. Because worry, as we're going to jump into Scripture, has been going on since the beginning of mankind once sin hit the earth. Worry, anxiety, constantly bombarding us. You see, I love the song, but from a substantive level, it's incorrect. Because if worrying could be eliminated by just being happy, then I could go to my happy space. Like, let's just say if my Cowboys win today and we make the playoffs, then then does that mean all my worries and anxiety are gone? No. That just means for three hours I'm on cloud nine, and then I'll stay on cloud nine until I go to bed, and then i got to face reality tomorrow. You see what I'm saying? If worry was all about you just going on your favorite vacation or your favorite little hangout spot, that's great. I'm, I'm all about being happy. I like to be happy. I'm not against being happy. It's not a sin to be happy. But being happy doesn't eradicate worry and anxiety, and I'll tell you why. Because Worry and anxiety, and anxiety will always trump happiness because happiness is fleeting. It's an emotion. It cannot share the same space with emotions like shame, anger, guilt. You ever try to be happy when you're feeling a lot of shame? When you're really angry? You ever try to be happy? Kind of hard. If you can do that, please share the recipe. When you think something's detestable, but I'm really happy right now. It's so detestable. That's awesome. But joy is different. See, we did the Choose Joy message series back in October because joy is a decision. And it's not just any decision. It's one with major ramifications because joy trumps worry and anxiety any day when your joy is found in the one who created joy, the one who is joy, the one that we sing joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. And you could keep, we sing it to kick off today's service. See, joy doesn't come and go. It sticks. It can exist It can coexist when things aren't going well. Whenever the doctor gives you a bad report, you can still have joy amidst the storm. We saw it all throughout the Bible. Whenever a relationship breaks down, you can still have joy because I am praying and believing that God's going to restore this relationship. What Satan intends for evil, we just sang it in Sea of Victory, Genesis 50, 20, when Joseph called out his brothers, God turns around. Romans 8, 28, for my good and his glory. Isn't that cool, the way God works? You can have joy, unspeakable joy, and full of glory, even amidst a trial. It's proven by the book we're getting ready to read out of. Because in Philippians, we're going to go there in just a second, Paul writes a great, the whole book is awesome, but he writes a great passage of Scripture while he is pretty much in perhaps his final days with the executioner maybe walking outside of his cell. He's he's suffered quite a bit, all to progress the gospel on his missionary journeys. He didn't back down, and he had great joy. You see, God's plan is that you overcome worry in life using his formula. 
I love in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, it says, do not grieve, or we could say, do not worry, do not have anxiety, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Just because the culture is telling you you shouldn't be joyful doesn't mean you can't have it with a choice to lean into God like never before. You know what will really make an impression on people who don't know Jesus Christ in your peer groups? in your workplaces, in your schools, in your communities, is when you got joy when they think you shouldn't have joy. That'll knock their socks off. Huh? What? You just found out you lost your job and your hope is in the Lord? What? How are you going to make it? You just found out that the relationship with your kid is no longer what you thought it was, and you're praying for them, you have joy that's still there because you have the love of the Lord in you, that doesn't make sense. Let's dive into the formula. It says in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. This is the Apostle Paul talking in a prison cell under Roman Empire rule. Fearing that, I don't know if he was fearing, I think he was ready to go see Jesus, but he was doing his thing. He was showing joy while the executioners at any minute could have ended his life. He says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. And then he says, do not be anxious about anything. Are you kidding me? If I'm in prison because of my faith, that seems to be the definition of anxiety. The definition of perhaps some worry. But he says, don't be anxious in anything, as he writes to the church of Philippi, but in every situation, by prayer and petition or supplication, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace, I love that, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And then let's go to verse 8. Then we're going to kind of unpack it. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Man, that's a mouthful. Paul just spit it out. He is challenging believers. He's challenging Bridgewood Church. He's challenging you. The Holy Spirit is using this scripture to challenge you. Look, you want to know how powerful Philippians 4, 6 is? Do not be anxious for anything. This year... 2019 on the Bible app. Anyone use the YouVersion Bible app on your device? Maybe you're using it right now. It's got like every version of the Bible known to mankind. It's awesome. 35.6 billion chapters were read on the app over the last year, and the most popular verse was Philippians 4.6. 5.6 billion chapters were listened to on the YouVersion Bible app in one year. 478 million verses have been shared. 1.1 million Bible plans have been completed. And 400 million people have already installed it on their device. And the YouVersion Bible app. Wouldn't you like to have some of that stock? You know what I mean? Here's the deal. I think it says a lot about our country. America is the most anxious nation on the planet of all time. Third world countries score healthier on the anxiety meter than America does. We are the most technologically advanced country in the history of mankind, the richest country in the history of mankind, have the most powerful military of any country, and yet we have the most anxiety. Why? It doesn't seem to make sense, or does it? Maybe we're feeding prey, or we are prey, that Satan is using what is seemingly our great country, which I love, and I love our people who defend it, but the culture of our great country to work against us. Look, the average child today exhibits the same level of anxiety as the average psychiatric patient in the 1950s. This hits home with me as a youth pastor. We talked about this, I believe, last week or two weeks ago, that Generation Z, which is our middle and high schoolers right now, sitting right over here, many of them, they deal with all kinds of decision-making anxiety because there's so many decisions to be made, decisions that we didn't have to deal with. Think about what's on your phone right now. 
That's just a snippet of it. All the different apps. I love customizable apps, but it offers a whole nother level, a whole nother world. The internet. You know, I was like almost 20 when the internet became like a main thing in our society. These kids have grown up in it. I'm not anti-internet, but we have to navigate it through God's power, direction, and anointing, do we not? Anxiety originated from the Latin root that means to choke, squeeze, or cause distress. It just didn't show up in our American vocabulary like, oh, we'll use this word to describe this feeling. That's what it comes from in the Latin. So we're going to give you a worry-free formula from Philippians 4, verses 4 through 8. And I pray this isn't just a series that you took good notes in, you got it all over the note app on your phone or maybe your tablet. I pray this is a series that you make applicable to your life each day going forward. Maybe you've already been exercising it because I needed it. I'm going to give some examples in a little bit where I, the last three weeks and today have already hit home with me in my life. And I believe you can relate. Number one in that formula, you've got to praise the Savior for his joy and peace. What does Paul do as he kicks off this amazing verse, uh, verses of Scripture in Philippians 4, 4 through 8? He says, rejoice in the Lord always, and I will say it again, rejoice. And he threw an exclamation point at the end just in case you didn't get his tone. There is something powerful to praising God, to worshiping God. How do we kick off each of our Sunday morning experiences? We do it in Bridgewood Kids. We do it on Wednesdays in Bridgewood Youth. We celebrate. We have a kickoff song. And then we go into eventual worship after that. Here on Sundays, you have three or sometimes four songs of worship, of praise. Why is that important? You want to know why that's important? Because usually when you're going through anxiety and stress, it's really easy to say, yeah, I want to praise God right now when you're not going through it. But when you are dealing with it, the last thing you want to do is put on some praise and worship music. Like, oh, I'll just listen to some Kenny G or Bobby McFerrin. Don't worry, be happy instead, right? Okay, half of you don't know who Kenny G is. That's good. See, whatever you focus on will determine how you see life. So when I put on worship music, it gears me, and I hope it does for you, or maybe it's just pull out the Bible, hard copy or digital version, and you just start reading Scripture. But when you praise God through music, through Scripture, it begins to give you an upward posture to where you begin to focus on God. And when the more you focus on God, the smaller your worry and anxiety gets, which is incredible. But just the reverse is true as well. Because if my worry and anxiety is always something that my focus is on, and every time I have to get with that family member over the holidays, I can't sleep for the two or three nights before, starting tonight, and I'm going to see him on Christmas, and I'm just sweating it out. They always say the wrong thing. They always put their foot in their mouth. Or I don't really want to go back to my job. The job is super stressful. My boss doesn't get me. And I'm always tossing and turning. And I can't get to sleep at night. Or my kids won't listen to me. You see, if that's all you look at, and I've been guilty of this, God is, gets, he, he begins to shrink. Not because of him, but because of you and your perspective. And pretty soon, all you can see is the mound, that hill of worry and anxiety overwhelming you in your life. And it can become super intimidating, and it's caused some people to give up on their faith walk. Remember Peter, when he stepped out of the boat? As long as he was focused on Jesus, he was like walking the waves. You know? Everything was great. But as soon as he took his focus off Jesus and put it on the anxiety of a storm that, and water, and no human has done this outside of Jesus, he started sinking. Anxiety will come up in a sudden flash, too. There's not always warning. And many times, it's not about something that may end up happening anyways. You just think it could be happening. You're playing all these different possibilities. I can remember when I was, uh, in 2013, Megan and I were at my former church in Maryland, and we decided, my wife and I did, that 
I wasn't working full time there. It was like kind of a part time youth pastor. And I said, I'm, we're going to put on a community fall festival. The Lord was calling us to do that. There really wasn't one done by a church. It was something like the Christmas Express, like Bridgewood did. And this was our first time, 2013. My wife's got amazing interior design skills. So it looked like it was like a tricked out like wedding reception, like you'd see on Pinterest. I mean, it was sweet. We had it decorated. It took us about a month to plan. And I remember the night that it was going to happen, October 30th, 2013, I walked into the side door of the church sanctuary because a little bit of worry hit me. We were leading a team of about 50 to 60 people, and I was a little nervous that what if, like, nobody shows up and I've sold my team that, oh, this is going to be awesome. Just wait and see. And some worry and anxiety began to hit me. And I had no clue I'd be speaking this message six-plus years later, but I remember going in, sitting on, we had pews at that time, sitting on the front pew. Nobody was in there. Lights were out. And I was just like, God, thank you for all you've done. You've really been great. You've gotten us to this point. But please let people show up. Please. We, this, we were taking a huge faith step for who we were in our church at the time. And wouldn't you know it, I come out. Ten minutes later, cars started piling up in the, in the parking lot. We had about 300 people. Four years later, we had 600 people there. The big church in town. And by the way, in Maryland, which is not a Bible Belt area, that's a lot of people. Uh, the big church in town, their pastors would come check it out because they liked it. And God began to bless that. And they weren't just checking out the aesthetics. They were checking out the teams that we were able to, like, see God just minister and use. And it I remember just going in, and I go back to that point, and whenever I'm struggling or I'm stressful about how things are going to turn out, I just start rejoicing in the Lord. Thank you. God, you got me to this point. Believe in you. You are awesome in my own way. Sometimes I throw music on. It was in Luke chapter 2, verses 10 through 14, where the angel showed up on the scene to the shepherds and says, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people today in the town of David. A Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. I know you probably heard that. I'll give you a chance to kind of digest that. I read that quick, but let me just get to the crux of the issue. These angels were with Jesus long before he showed up in earth in the form of a baby. He always was and always is, and God sent him down through a virgin. So they knew what was going down. They were experiencing great joy, but they knew that that great joy was going to only be completed when he gave his life in a gruesome death of crucifixion 33 and a half years later. And yet they still had great joy. Do you understand? You can have it too. Even though you may be looking at something that seems so dismal, you can have the joy the angels had because they were rejoicing in this moment. They even prophesied. They said, you will find a baby wrapped in cloths lying in a manger. When I went out to Israel in 2018, this blew my mind. We went to Bethlehem, a Palestinian Christian. Bethlehem is not under Israeli rule. It's under Palestinian rule in Israel. So if you're an Israeli Jewish person, you can't go in. I think I butchered that, but you get the drift. You, get, you can't go in to, uh, unless you have special permission into Bethlehem. The Palestinian Christian tour guide says, this is the way they wrapped the lambs, the, sh the baby lambs that were going to be saved for sacrifice and swaddling cloths. It had nothing to do because it was cold. This was a sign to the shepherds that this was going to be the sacrificial lamb right here. In a stone, not a wooden, it's stone, it was in a cave. Sorry to blow that picture out of the water too for you. You walk down into a cave and everything is stone in Bethlehem. And the angel said, I give you good news of great joy. See, you can have it amidst your situation that right now doesn't seem like it should be anything re re revolving around joy because you're rejoicing in the Lord that already overcame death and hell, and he is there for you. Number two, worry-free formula, Philippians 4, 4 through 8, 
pray to God who is with us. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation. Everybody say every situation. Do you know what that means? That means every situation. By prayer and petition. We sometimes like to kind of look at, to make a list. Okay, I'll, these are really serious. I'll pray for this. Do you know what can kill you in terms of anxiety and stress? Or all the little small worry wart areas that for some reason we leave off our plate of prayer. We want to handle them. We're going to be our own boss. I'm going to be my own savior. No, give it to God. He's the one who can take care of your need. Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Fear triggers either prayer or despair. When you go through anxiety and fear, it'll trigger one or the other. And the path to peace is always paved with prayer. Let me go one step further. Whenever you deal with worry and anxiety, I'll let that be an alarm to pray. God wakes you up in the middle of the night. I'm a dead sleeper, okay? God blessed me with that great gene, and fortunately, he gave it to my two girls. We didn't have to spend a lot of sleepless nights with them when they were like little wee things. But every now and then, I wake up in the middle of the night, and I'm like, you know what I do now? Like three or four in the morning or five, and I'm like, I'm not getting up that early ever. And so... Um, <laughs> And so, like, I go, God, I'm, i got to start praying about something. You, I, I wasn't dealing with any stress. I do that whether I'm dealing with stress or not. There's something i got to pray about. I'll just come up with something. Like, if I don't have a pressing need, I'll just pray for my wife and my kids and my parents and my brother and his family and our church and our pastoral staff. Just start praying for them. Pray for students. Just, hey, you know that situation with that student, this student? When you get a worry alarm that sets off in your mind and you can't sleep, start praying. Guarantee you'll fall asleep while you're praying. Works every time for me. Every time. And you're going, you talk about sleeping in heavenly peace. You just prayed yourself to sleep. Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 through 23. I love this about Joseph. The angel appeared to him in a dream. And this was God's way of communicating with him. It says, after he considered this, you know what the this was? Should I divorce Mary? My, my virgin fiance is prego, pregnant. That ain't supposed to happen. It never happened before Mary. It haven't, hasn't happened since. And listen to this. In those days, you were scorned. You could even be stoned for that. So he's thinking, I'll divorce her quietly. I'll do the gentleman noble thing. But, an, but after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Look, Jesus was born with taste buds like you, with smelly feet like you. He could walk like you, run like you. He was raised by a dad, Joseph, his earthly dad, who taught him carpenter skills. Some of you have that. He didn't even start his earthly ministry until he was 30 years old. He was pretty much under the radar for most of his life. Maybe you feel that way. He understands your need. He's been there. He's done that. He gets you. He was tempted by Satan. He could have easily caved. He fasted for 40 days. He was pretty hungry. He gets where you're at. You need to give him a chance to address him with every need you have. He will deal with your anxiety way better than you can deal with your anxiety. Number three, Worry-free formula, Philippians 4, verse 4 through 8. We're going to trust God with gratitude amidst the chaos. Remember, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Present your request to God with thanksgiving. Anxiety and gratitude cannot coexist in the same heart. Here's what you got to do the next time you're anxious. You need to form a gratitude list. And you're like, yeah, I'm ready. Let me jump on it now. You're probably not anxious right now. When you get anxious, the last thing you want to do is form a gratitude list a lot of times. It's hard. You're ticked off about something. Somebody did you in. Life's beating you up. And the last thing you want to do is start going, thank you, Jesus, for this, having, giving me a car with four wheels at work on the road. 
Thank you, Jesus, for giving me a church who loves me. Thank you, Jesus, for allowing me to have uh, a house and a living in the richest country on earth. And I don't have to carry my water in a bucket walking five miles each way. Just barely enough water to, like, cook with. Thank you, Jesus. Maybe your gratitude list is more detailed than that. I just gave you some general ones we can all relate to. Thank you that I have breath. Thank you that I have ability in my legs and my limbs. Thank you. When you make a gratitude list, the anxiety will begin to dissipate and go. Here's the thing, though. Anxiety can be addicting. When you are stressed out and constantly under worry and anxiety, a lot of times you want to stay there. Because misery loves company. Gloom and doom, baby. If I can't be happy, nobody is. I'm going to bring everyone down in the process. So I'm challenging you. Right now, write it down. If you're not going through major anxiety, you need to write a note to yourself that when I do, I'm forming a gratitude list. I'm going to, if I'm a student sitting in here, I'm going to thank the Lord for, if I've got at least one parent, let alone two parents who go to church, I'm going to thank the Lord for that. I may not like all their rules, but man, am I blessed. I've, I've dealt with students in youth ministry that didn't only have two parents who did not go to church, they didn't have two parents at all. They just wanted a family. And if you don't have two parents coming to the church, or maybe you just have a solo parent, pray for them. Thank the Lord you got the, the, uh, the, the awesome luxury of prayer that you can bestow upon. Bring this parent to a saving knowledge of you. It was about two months ago that I was flying to Baltimore, Washington International, going to a, uh, a men's conference on the East Coast that I'd been to many years before. And I was guilty of not putting enough margin, Pastor Kurt, into my travel schedule. As I hit all that mega traffic, it's demonic as you go up 75 during the middle of the day to the airport. And when I pulled in to my short-term parking spot there at the airport, I'm not making this up. I had 35 minutes before my flight took off. I'm not even in the airport. It was a Thursday, so not incredibly crazy, but still, I don't want to do that again. And as I hustled in with my bag, I go up to the desk, Southwest desk, and I go, hey, I got 35 minutes. Can you put this bag on the fastest conveyor belt you got? And the guy's like, well, we're just going to put it on the conveyor belt. And I'm like, do you think it'll get there? Before? He goes, you'll get there. I think your bag will. But if not, it'll be on the next flight. And I'm like, oh. You know, the next flight wasn't going to get there to like close to midnight. And, you know. I'm like, well, thanks for all you can do. Really do appreciate that. He's like, yeah, we'll do our best to get it on your flight. So I hustled out to the gate, and I was talking to the Southwest gate people, and I'm like, hey, I'm looking for my bag. Like, they've got other things, but I'm like, my bag is so important to me. And I'm like, they're like, well, they'll probably bring it up into a golf, a golf cart will bring it up. And I'm like, yeah, I can see the bags, and I'm looking. I'm thinking, is one of those my bags? No, nah, it's not. Then out of nowhere, here comes the golf cart, like in a movie. And there's my, and it has one bag and it's mine. And I was like, yes, that's my bag. It's coming with me. And I decided I was, Megan was stressing out. She stresses out over these things. You have to marry someone like this to keep you in line. And I circled it and I said, babe, there it is. It's going on the plane. And she rolled her eyes in an emoji and sent that back to me. But here's the deal. I was thanking them. And I had faith in them. You have a heavenly father that's got a perfect track record. If there's anyone to thank, it's him. You lay your stress, your strain at his feet. And you let him work with it the best way possible. It may not be your way, but it'll be the best way. Because he may want to stretch you in the process to develop some traits in you that you need. The fourth element of the formula for living a worry-free life is consume yourself with godly character. Bathe in godly character. Remember, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. 
If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about it. Live it. Operate in it. You can't control your circumstances, but you can control how you think of them. You can't determine the lemons that are going to come your way in life, but you can't control if you're going to bite into them and chew on them and keep them hanging around you. We have to take control of how we go about these things. You know, it's real easy to have character when I'm up on stage as a pastor, but I have to live this too. Like I can, oh, I can, you know, as a pastor, I can show that I have great character, but you know where my character is defined? When I'm at home with my family, am I famous in my own home or am I the dad or husband who just turns it on when he gets here on the stage? How am I when it's just me and my device and my phone and my computer? How am I when I'm with the fellas or the girlfriends out and about that don't, don't go to church? They're my other friends that I'm being like, I'm living on mission with. That's good. But how am I around them? Do I reveal the character? Because you can nail the first three, but sometimes, and by the way, I want you to live on mission with the ungodly people. That's what Jesus did. Do that. I'm just saying have godly character in the process. Make sure we get that right. I'm all about that. But here's the deal. Sometimes we nail the first three, but our life lacks character. And then that develops its own stress and anxiety because we know we're not living the way we need to before our maker who knows us on the inside and out. It says this in Matthew chapter 1, verses 24 through 25. When Joseph woke up, after the angel explained to him, you're going to marry Mary. You're not going to discard her. What's in her is from the Holy Spirit. This is the Messiah. Joseph revealed his godly character. He didn't wake up and go, no, I can't deal with this. This is too much stress. He goes, or he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. And then this is really key. Sometimes we skip over this. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Basically, consummation means he didn't have physical intimacy with his wife. She was fully virgin when she gave birth to Jesus. Godly character as a man. That's important. People closest to you know your character the most. I want you to beat worry, I want you to beat anxiety, but you gotta have the godly character in the process. Faith is the opposite of worry. Faith is always the opposite of worry. If you have, we all will go through periods of worry. Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane, but you can't stay perpetually in that. If that stays persistent and excessive, it negates your faith. It begins to defeat your faith and defeat who you are in Christ. You have to keep the faith. I'm going to paraphrase Matthew 6, 25 through 27. Basically, it says... Don't worry about what you'll eat or drink or what you will wear. If I clothe the lilies of the field and I give the birds of the air food and drink and they do not store or reap, how much more you created in my image will I take care of you? My all-time favorite verse, Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then everything else will be added unto you. And then verse 34, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough worry of its own. Give us this day, as he said in Matthew 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, give us this day, as he told us how to pray, our daily bread. Don't give it to us tomorrow. Give us this today, our daily bread. I want to live in today. I'm not going to live in tomorrow's battles. I'm not going to try to fight yesteryear's battles. I'm living today. Today is the day that God gives me my daily bread. Let me encourage you in this. As you bow your head and close your eyes. You can beat. You can beat worry. You can beat anxiety, fear. It does not have to strangle you. It does not have to control you. It does not have to dictate to you. If you'll do it through the formula that Paul wrote about in Philippians 4, verses 4 through 8, I would meditate on that. And if you'll just read the Christmas story, Mary and Joseph had every reason to live in anxiety, stress, worry. They had a king who wanted to kill their son. They're bearing the Christ child. They're going to Bethlehem. 
they're, they're scattering to Egypt, and yet they were the perfect epitome of calm and peace because they traded their panic for peace, their chaos for calm because of Christ. So if that's you today, and you want to live in that, you want to reside in calm and peace and not reside in panic and chaos, you want to be a Philippians 4 verses 4 through 8 worry-free Christian. Doesn't mean you don't have it on occasions, but perpetually worry-free. If that's you, raise your hand with every head bowed and every eye closed. I see those hands. I'm with you. I am with you. Here's what we're going to do. Can I get you to stand? We're going to take communion. There's tables in the back. There's two up front. What a, (laughs) there's no better moment than to come before the Lord's table saying, I put my worries at your feet. I'm going to remember your body and your blood you poured out for me because without that, I have no hope. I have no peace. But with your, your sacrifice, God, you came as a baby and you gave it your all. After three and a half years of ministry, you went and you died a gruesome death on the cross. You did it for me. I can be thankful for that. Now there's my gratitude list right there. I just got number one. I got a Messiah. I got a Savior who's thankful. And then I can just keep adding to it. You are greater than my worry. So I'm going to ask you to come forward as we sing, and then we're going to take the elements together. Let's do it.